that sense of of sovereignty was so important in um, the, certainly the Gaelic tradition, which is all of the the only tradition that we have text for. So that's like Ireland, Scotland, the Isle of Man. That the king would literally marry the land. There was a ceremony, the banisri, um, literally the, the 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 marriage of the king, um, which would take place quite late. You know, up to to relatively recent times in history. It wasn't prehistory by any stretch of the imagination, where the king would have a, a ceremonial marriage with the goddess of the land, and he would commit on behalf of his people to live in balance and harmony and the goddess of the land sovereignty would therefore keep everything going very well. And the other thing I love about our mythology is that when that promise is broken, there are consequences. And I love a good consequence, you know, so you don't just get to do that. You're just like, Oh, well maybe, you know, do better next time. No, if you mess up, the land becomes a wasteland or there is a flood, you know, from, from one extreme to the other. There are always consequences if you do not live in a way that is in balance and harmony with the land. And that's a very, very good mythology to have, I think. I'm Olivia Clementine, and this is Love and Liberation. Today, our guest is Dr. Sharon Blackie. Sharon is an award-winning writer and internationally recognized teacher whose work sits at the interface of psychology, mythology, and ecology. Her highly acclaimed books, courses, lectures, and workshops are focused on the development of the mythic imagination and on the relevance of myth, fairy tales, and folk traditions to the personal, social, and environmental problems we face today as well as writing four books of fiction and nonfiction, including the best-selling If Women Rose Rooted. Her writing has appeared in several international media outlets, among them The Guardian, The Irish Times, and The Scotsman. Her books have been translated into several languages, and she has been interviewed by the BBC, US Public Radio, and other broadcasters on her areas of expertise. to begin with, just to ground us into your personal experience. For you, what was the turning point in, in your relationship with land and, and our larger earth body where you felt like it was your refuge, like you really recognized it was your refuge and a, and a healer for you as well? I think the big moment for me was when my husband and I moved from um, a, a slightly gentler croft in the northwest of Scotland. A croft is a, a kind of a small holding, let's say, a tenanted small holding, to the Isle of Lewis in the Outer Hebrides in 2010. And we were looking to get as far away from civilization as we could because we had pretty much had it. And um, we ended up in a very, very wild place. Uh, we could see St Kilda from our... Um, kitchen window and beyond St Kilda there is only the Americas so uh, it was a very extreme place wind from all directions and it was a very remote place in terms of people so there was nobody really to talk to mm -hmm. and so I talked to the land and it was a land that had been once you know fairly heavily populated by crofters smallholders but had been abandoned over the decades because people wanted to move to the towns and the cities for, for better work. And I felt as if I were the only person talking to that land and talking to the, um, to various aspects of the landscape rocks, you know, I would have a relationship with particular rocks and I would see people or some of the old gods and goddesses in the rocks. And I would talk to them and I would talk to crows and seabirds and, you know, whatever came along. And, to cut a long story short, I think the extremity of that relationship, because for me, in a way, you know, apart from my husband, that was all there was, really made me understand how, what it was to be in, in proper relationship with the land, to go out and talk to it, just as you would go out and talk to a neighbour or a friend or a relative. And the whole experience was profoundly transformative for me, even though I'd been working my way into, you know, that way of being in the land for for a number of years beforehand. Mm. And 
I, you know, I, I know many of us feel quite estranged and we're searching for belonging and, and maybe even some of us have belonging and don't even recognize it. What are some ways to begin um, that relationship? How do we come home through land? Yeah, I mean, I, do, I just want to preface it by saying that to me, belonging is a choice. Mm-hmm. It's a choice that you make. Um, a lot of people find themselves in a position where they constantly feel that they're in the wrong place. They constantly feel that they can't belong. And without wanting to sound harsh about it, it is a choice. You know, you go out and you find a way to belong. So that's a really, really important thing to me. I believe that the places that we live deserve something from us. You know, they give us life. They are hosting us and they deserve our attention back. So you don't get to choose not to belong to a place if you live in it. I think that that's kind of, I really do feel very strongly about that. You know, I think it's kind of a moral thing. We owe it, you know, like you wouldn't abandon a child or a puppy or whatever. Um, I'm not saying that the land is helpless like a child or a puppy, but it, it, it's just not a choice. Um, to to turn away from it. If you are living on it, you owe something to it. So I think we have a kind of obligation to learn to belong. And to me, it is very much about, it, it's really very simple. It is about going outside wherever outside is for you, whether it's a city or a town or a, a wilderness place and addressing um, everything that you encounter as if it were conscious, animate, which of course it is, um, as if it as if it recognized you just as you recognize it. And again, being just being polite to it like you would a neighbor. You know, um, I remember once reading a book uh, by a, a wonderful um, anthropologist, Australian anthropologist, Deborah Bird Rose. And she was talking about the Australian Aboriginal perspective of what they call country. Um, you know, which is basically the places where they live. And she had this wonderful quote from a native of those places that basically said, you know, you don't sneak around country. You know, you've got you've got to show yourself. You've got to introduce yourself. Otherwise, it's just kind of sneaky. You know, it's not a good thing to do. And I kind of feel that about our places. So I talk to trees. I talk to rocks. I talk to crows, you know, whatever I encounter. And that to me is the simplest fail safe way of creating a sense of relationship with our places which leads inevitably to a sense of belonging to them and what do you feel that part of us comes from that doesn't want to make that choice i think we get i think we tend to be a bit picky you know i today <laughs> you know i'm 60 so i get to be able to say this i sound like my granddad did once upon a time but um i think we 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 think it's kind of we think it's an optional extra i think i i think we are um we're alienated in so many ways today that we just see alienation as kind of the default position and we don't see that a lot of that has to do with us we we mm. see ourselves as kind of a you know powerless in the world acting upon us and I think we forget that actually we are the ones who have agency and that agency enables us to go and be in relationship with the world. So, um, yeah, to, to, to me, it, it really is a choice. Um, we, we go out there, we create it. We even in, in places where we think we we won't be forever. It doesn't matter, you know, whether you're going to be in a place for, well, for, for three days or, or for three years or for the rest of your life. It's still hosting you and you know be polite talk to it (laughs) and and do you feel like one can belong to a place that's not close to their birthplace as much as they can I mean I know a lot of people don't feel connected to their birthplace uh, or country of origin what are your thoughts on that that's a complicated one you know because I I would have said to you until about two years ago that I, I did not feel connected to the place I grew up which was the northeast of England in a in, in in many ways a very heavily industrialized zone, in other ways very beautiful with you know long stretches of sand dunes and pretty countryside and not far um, away from the place where I grew up, a, a really big wilderness area, UK style, you know, we're not talking the Rockies here, but but nevertheless it it's unpopulated. And I would have said to you that I didn't like the Northeast, I didn't like anything about it, you know, I wanted to be West or whatever. I didn't want to be Northeastern. Again, to cut a long story short, it I have had a, 
a real sense in the past few years of my life of, of coming full circle to place. Um, and two years ago, actually, literally on the day of the first COVID lockdown <laughs> in the UK, we moved from Ireland, where I had chosen to go, which is a part of my genetic heritage, I'm like 25% Irish or something, which I thought was the more romantic part of my heritage and the more romantic country. And we moved back here to actually to Wales um, precisely because I felt that very, very strong, incredibly strong tug of the place that I had initially rejected. And, you know, I've been in lockdown now for two years um, and being immunocompromised as a result of um, treatment for lymphoma, I can't go anywhere for a while. I am desperate to get back to the Northeast. It feels like a real necessity and that sense of belonging. It's almost as if it's taken me an entire lifetime to figure out that that had something that I really needed mm -hmm. that was important and rich and beautiful. And so I think, I don't think that there is any one right way of belonging. You know, I think you can belong to the place where you were born and grew up and that will be it for you forever. And other people will have a genuine sense of, no, that was not it for me. I need to be somewhere else. And I don't think there's anything that says you have to belong in a particular way. I think certain, I, I do feel very strongly that places call to us when we need them. Um, for me, places have been the greatest teachers of my life. Every time I've made a, a major shift in my life, in understanding, in career, if you want to call it that, in, in my concept of who I am, it's been linked to, and it's kind of a bit of a chicken and egg situation, you know, which comes first, but it's always been linked to a move to place because places reflect us and they teach us. And I, I think, I don't think there's any one right way to do it. And where are you in Wales right now? Is in the mid Wales, in um, Powys, which um, in, in the Cambrian mountains, uh, where my mother moved when I was 18 and lived here for, for 30 years. So that's kind of, that's a halfway house. I'm almost back in the Northeast <laughs> where my mother was from, where I spent the, the first 10 years of my life, but not quite, not quite there yet. Mm. Do you find that some of these places that you've been to, or even where you are now, um, there's some kind of connection to previous lifetimes or some, cause you know, there's like these deep memories, right. In land, when you stand on, on a piece of land and you're connected to time beyond right now, right. Everything that came prior to it. Um, do you have any sense of, of that kind of relationship of, of you in previous times, previous forms? I don't actually. And it's not that I don't believe in it. I've not felt that. No, I think, um, I mean, I do feel a very strong sense of, ancestry um kind of but, but i'm talking about my my family now you know in certain places mm. like the north and like in ireland um whether that's a past life thing or just a sense of my ancestors in this life going back i, I don't know um i'm quite open to, to to that but i i've never felt it myself no so in your book the enchanted life i'm going to read a, a little passage from it um we think that we imagine the land, but perhaps the land imagines us. And in its imagining, it shapes us. The exterior landscape interacts with our interior landscape. And in the regulating entanglements, we become something more than we otherwise could ever hope to be. We take on and begin to express something of its mysterious earthy qualities. In turn, we offer it our stewardship, our poetry, and our songs. We offer it to our breath, blood, bones, and endless flakes of sea skin. This was such a relief to read this, this exchange, something about there not being a boundary, that it's not just the taking from land, it's how we can open ourselves further into this co-imagining. It's deeply nourishing, just, just the sensation of it for me as a receiver of that, those words alone. A lot of it is in trying to understand that the boundary that we think um kind of is our ending literally you know the skin is not really a boundary at all that we are porous and so in the enchanted life right at the beginning one of the examples i use is somebody walking in a wood and smelling bluebells 
um, I don't know whether you have blue bells in any part of them, I can't remember, but just, just imagine that there is a, a beautiful flower, you know, in the woods. And, you know, we tend to look at a blue, uh, say a, a blue bell or a flower in the woods as though it's an object and the smell kind of happens to us, you know, and it's apart from us. But when you think of it, the, the blue bell is emitting particles that are entering our body. Mm. We are becoming blue bell, you know, blue bell is in us. It's not, it doesn't stop at the skin. It's actually in us. Um, and so my, my, my aim in that book particularly was to try and break down this sense of the boundary between us and the external world. And if you do that, and again, part of it is, is talking to, to, to objects, but part of it is just trying to, to see yourself as more porous, you know, than we imagine mm. ourselves to be and to literally enter into the, the, the world uh, what I call the dreaming of the land around us. What would it be? To, you know, how when we touch a stone, we think of it, you know, as our hands kind of being plonked onto a hard object outside of us. But in a sense, the stone is touching us. Mm. And I think it's that sense of challenging the way that we think of ourselves in the world in an embodied sense and trying to break down that container that we think confines and defines us so that we recognize ourselves as a little bit more porous. And that's one aspect of it. There are many others, but that's that's probably a good place to start. Yeah, that's very, very helpful. And I, I know for myself, when I've uh, heard about different archetypes for humans, I'm, I often feel quite limited in the human archetypes, but you share about the nature archetypes, which actually felt um, like the right breath that I personally needed for archetypal explorations. Can you speak on landscape archetypes and, and, and that relationship? Like how do we, in our own mind, use that relationship to, for, for greater self-knowledge and even just relationship with our greater earth body? Yeah, I mean, you know, in, in a sense, some of it is, is, it seems a little bit obvious, perhaps, you know, so that if we think of, we think of an island, well, actually, islands are complicated, but we, we tend to think of, you know, solitude, perhaps, mm -hmm. um, isolation being cut off. Um, we tend to think of um, being very self-sufficient, perhaps, because we don't have a lot of networks. If we think of um, a mountain, we have this sense of spaciousness and airiness. If we think of a lake, we have this sense of going very, very deep. Um, you know, and, and so I think that, that often the, the reason why we um, find ourselves drawn to a particular landscape, whether it's for a, you know, a day out or a, a week's holiday or to live in a place is because something in that is ref in that landscape is reflecting what's happening in our lives at the moment. You know, so if we want to go deep, we're perhaps drawn to the sea, depending on the particular kind of sea it is. Um, if we want a little bit of space, then we're drawn, drawn maybe to the mountains. And, and, you know, that sounds very obvious, doesn't it? But I think it really, I think it really isn't. I do think that these places reflect aspects of us that we need to get in touch with. And that, you know, is one of the reasons why I think place is, is, is so very important. So one of the exercises that I often get people to do in workshops when I'm teaching about place is to say, okay, if you were a place, what would you be? Write it. And again, in the Enchanted Life, I wrote, um, I wrote that for myself. If I were a place, I would be an island. And it was very much a reflection of the Isle of Lewis, where I spent those very transformative um, and fairly radical years in association with place. Um, and it was about, you know, if you come and find the island, uh, if you turn up on a rich man's yacht, it's you're not going to be welcome. If you come on a little wooden coracle, then maybe you've got a chance. And it, it was just that sense. And at the heart of the island, um, you know, there's this little hidden wood and there's a house and a fox skin hanging on the door and what have you. It's just that sense of what an island means to me 
mm. as a place that I actually know, but also what it reflects about my own inner life and my particular yearnings and my particular way of being in the world. And I think we can all think of that. And, and it changes over time. You know, it's not just one thing always and forever. As I said, sometimes I, I feel like I'm like I'm a desert. Um, so it's just a question of saying, well, what does a desert mean to me? To me, again, it's that issue of stripping bare, of nowhere to hide because there's all that sky um, and of animal, you know, of creatures like snakes inhabiting it that have a propensity for shedding skin. That is what a desert is to me. To somebody else, it might be other aspects of the desert that are important and the, their desert archetype will be a little bit different, but they all will have similar um some kind of similar thread that we see so in in a in a kind of fairly simplistic nutshell that's what i mean when i talk about landscape archetypes and the way in which place reflects us are there any creatures right now in your landscape that you're in relationship with i i know one creature i recently appreciated from your sharings was certainly the shape-shifting Heron, I don't know if you have any right now that you're feeling quite close with. Well, it's interesting question that because when we moved here to Wales um, two years ago, um, in the mountains here, the most dominant bird, apart from the ubiquitous crows and you know the garden birds uh, which are everywhere, the most dominant bird is a bird called the red kite, and it's a um, it's a kind of scavenger bird of prey. It'd be like, it'd be kind of like, kind of like a buzzard, but it's very, very beautiful mm. and quite rare um, in, in most parts of the UK, but very ubiquitous here. And because I had never lived anywhere where there was this red kite, I had no idea how to approach it. I didn't know what it was. You know, if I see a crow, I know what a crow is in my mythology. Um, it is, um, it's a trickster. Um, it is a shapeshifter for sure. It's a very serious shapeshifting goddess in the Irish mythology, the Morrigan. You know, I know what a crow is. I, I and, and that's something that perhaps I ought to just specify before I, I move on, that, that there are two levels to me of an understanding a creature like a bird or an animal. There's the there's knowing what it is, what its biology is, you know, what what its patterns are, where it likes to lay eggs nests what it eats what its song is you know so there's the kind of the physical characteristics it's really important to me to know that what a crow is in the world but then there's this kind of mythical overlay using what i call the mythic imagination where you think okay what else is a crow on a kind of imaginal level or on a mythic level and i had none of that for the red kite so i know the red kite you know as a bird i understand where it lays its eggs and i understand what it eats carcasses dead mostly <laughs> um but i didn't have that mythical overlay because i'd never encountered it and it's not a very common bird in our folklore curiously and um it was just kind of written off as a scavenger you know not very interesting but uh, but it was really bugging me because they were everywhere and i didn't know how to relate to them i felt uh, you know i felt as if i wasn't getting them that was very rude um and one day um i, I had undergone in the past year quite a series of health issues having been remarkably healthy all my life um when we moved here i had a, a a very sudden onset aggressive arthritis which meant that i was really finding it very very difficult to move and to complete everyday tasks for a while and then i was diagnosed with lymphoma earlier this year so i was in this kind of state of crisis and we were all in lockdown and the world seemed to be going crazy and one day i i managed to um, stagger out of the house and i looked up at one of our fields and there was a red kite stripping a carcass i don't know what it was rabbit or something like that and and instantly um the, the the name came to me old bone mother and that again that sense of the kite stripping away the flesh and leaving the bones kind of the essence of what the creature was um stripping away all the decaying stuff the dead you know the dying flesh and leaving leaving the, the the purity the beautiful white bones kind of as a an archetype of death almost but in a kind of compassionate and necessary way and so from that point on my my whole relationship with a red kite changed because i felt as if i knew 
one of the, the things that the red kite could be. And given that I was being pretty much stripped away myself at the time, it, it felt like a very um, welcome partner in an ongoing process of transformation. So interesting. I, yeah, I appreciate. So you, you then from your own actual experience in that moment have now identified it as that relationship. It's not like a mythology that's written someplace. It's your own. No, it's not. And I think that's really important. And that's also one of the ways that we find, we find ways of belonging Mm -hmm. Uh, because particularly, uh, as I said, you know, a lot, a lot of the people, I I would say the majority of people who do my online courses or come to workshops or or teaching um, situations that, that I give in a normal world, um, are from North America. And I'm constantly hearing this problem of belonging because of people living in a landscape where they don't have long ancestry and where the mythological overlay appears on the surface to belong to a different people, to, to, to the Native Americans. And I'm constantly hearing, you know, how do I find my story? Because, you know, all of my ancestral stories are over there and yet I'm here. And my answer to that um it, it, again simplifying it's a long story and in a nutshell is always about finding uh, finding a way to recognize the archetypal energies in the place because that's how it happened in the beginning you know um stories don't stories of place don't ever end Place is always transforming, just as we're always transforming. And the energies in a place are infinitely fluid. And so, you know, one of the examples I give, that that's one I would give now. Um, but the other example I give is when, when I was in the Isle of Lewis um, for, uh, for for that four years, the, the major um, mythical character who was present in that place, as, as in so much of Scotland and Ireland, was um, the old woman who created and shaped the land in our mythology, um, an old being called the Kaliach, which literally means in, in Gaelic old, old woman. And she was everywhere in the place names, in the shapes of rocks, in you know, folk tales about her. And um, when I was in Lewis, she was the person I talked to everywhere because she was just everywhere in the landscape, folk tales about her everywhere. And then I ended up in the one part of Ireland, probably, where there were no folk tales about the Kaliak. And I felt completely lost. I didn't know what to do with myself because mm-hmm. she had been my companion for four years. And again, to cut a long story short, we lived on a river um, and there was a heronry behind our house. You referred to the heron before. This is this is how that began, really. And I was just desperate to find, you know, where's the old woman in my landscape? And one morning I was walking the dogs at dawn. Um, there was a heron sitting in the middle of the river and we startled her and she took off into the skies with that, you know, great croaky shriek um, that herons have. And I thought, goodness me, she sounds for all the world like an old hag. Ah, oh. And again, into my head popped this idea of um, old crane woman. Um, Heron and crane are interchangeable in Irish mythology. By the time I got home from that walk, this being was in my head who I've written about, half woman, half heron, and I had found the old woman in my place. And it didn't need there to be an existing story. You know, it it was in, it was a kind of, I would say an act of co-creation, but that's a very overused word these days, but it kind of is a kind of act of, of, it's really an act of imagination. Mm. Somewhere in the space between me and the land, this being had arisen. And anybody can do that anywhere. Anybody can do it. You can always find the old woman in your place. There'll be something there that reminds you of, that has that archetypal energy, whether it's a particular kind of rock, whether it's a particular kind of animal, whatever it is. And Mm. so to me, that is the practice of the mythic imagination is going into a place and saying, okay, what are the, what are the energies? What are the stories? What are the beings that are lurking here that I can interact with in a way that is authentic to me and not borrowing or appropriating anybody else's perception of that particular archetypal energy. I really appreciate you sharing that. I'm sure many people will be able to learn from that in their own lives and as you're sharing I feel like that need to what you just said like to to really drop into a place and let those preconceived judgments of what it means to be connected or to be to have a mythological relationship with place or or creatures it to get to that authentic place seems so significant 
I think, it, I, again, it's really, I think it is really important because without that sense of being able to, to approach the land in that way and to feel a sense of, uh, of that being okay. Mm-hmm. And again, I, I don't think it's okay. I think it's a moral obligation. You know, the land needs us to be in relationship with it. We have to find a way in. It doesn't care where we came from. It cares that we show up. And finding a way to show up and to be in relationship and to find the stories between us and the land is absolutely essential, I think, to that whole concept of belonging, but not just for us, for the land's sake as well, mm. you know, because we keep it alive in that way. I think another, another thing that we often forget here in, let's just loosely call it the West, when we look to, say, the Native Americans, or we look east to Taoists for their sense of balance and harmony, is that all of our old myths and folk tales are exactly the same. You know, they tell us about living in balance and harmony with the land. Mm. The only difference is we we had a break here where, um, and it's very recent break from seeing those old stories as actual, you know, cosmology as a way of believing in the world. And now we think of them as just kind of like stories for kids, you know, just entertaining fairy tales. They don't really matter. We've forgotten that they were part of our belief system once upon a time, but they're there and they're very, very strong. And one of the examples I often give is, is if you go back in Europe, if you go back to classical Greece, um, which are some of the oldest stories and texts that we have in this part of the world, you find philosophers like Plato taking it for granted that the entire world was ensouled. Everything had a soul, not just us. And Plato proposed, um, which wasn't new, it wasn't an original idea of his, but, but he wrote about the ancient idea of the anima mundi, the soul of the world, which according to his um people's beliefs back in those days where we're talking about you know in the centuries bc um the creator whoever that was um or whatever that was had created the world and and the anima mundi throughout it so that everything was connected we were not the only ones that had souls a rock had soul a bird had soul and it was all part of a, a vast network and it's always seemed to me that that if that if that is true we have an obligation to keep it alive. We have an obligation to keep it vibrant. Um, and we can, and we do that by participation in it. We do that by relationship, by talking to a crow, by acknowledging a rock. You know, we just, it, it's polite. It acknowledges that that that, that thing, whatever it is, that being is, is as ensouled as we are. It's different in nature, clearly. We all have different gifts and different ways of being in the world, but it is no different. Again, according to our oldest belief systems in Europe, it's really not that long ago. We've only lost them in the past, you know, three, maybe 400 years. It's so easy to pick up on them again. And I think part of my passion is for helping people to understand that that is our lineage. That's our legacy. It's always been there and we can reclaim it. And it's very beautiful. Do you feel like there's some significance? Because when I hear in soul, for me, I immediately go to themes of eternity. Like the soul is here forever, right? It's this unchanging aspect, but yet there's so much change also in what we're speaking of. And um, it seems like there's just a lot of wisdom in, in that duality between the two of like, we need to keep that relationship alive and, and honor and be polite to the soul of, of animals and, and elements and our, and our landscapes and home um, and, and sensing that kind of unchanging aspect, but also that it, it requires us to be there. Like it's not just something that uh, is given in a way. Yeah, yeah the, 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 like just as our souls need nurturing, um, you know, whatever we think of, of that as, as meaning, then, then the wider world soul needs nurturing. It needs attention to be paid to it. It needs to be cared about. Um, mm-hmm. we, can't, we can't change everything, or sometimes I feel we can't change anything very much. But what we can do, every one of us, is care about 
the world and about the soul of the world. And who knows whether that may be enough? We don't know. Mm. We don't know what's enough. We don't know what's going to happen to the world. Um, but whatever else we do, just by being there and being in relationship, we, we do something very, very important, I think. Mm. What are your thoughts on intimate relationship and how our courage or capacity for intimacy is impacted by our tethering to the earth? It's really difficult to answer because I do believe very strongly. I am, I am very much a proponent of that, of that ancient Greek kind of, and later and wider philosophy, which says that, that each soul incarnates in a particular lifetime in order to learn certain things to bring a gift to the world always a unique gift that only we can bring that's what plato said but he also said that we come here to learn something and so i think that it depends i think for me that relationship is something that i have to learn about um i think it is part of my task in life and when i say relationship i'm talking about otherness in a very very broad way so sometimes it's relationship with other humans. Sometimes it's relationship with a wider world, with place, with anything that is other to me. Mm-hmm. How, do I, how do I accommodate that without losing a sense of myself? And I think that has been part of my own particular learning through the decades. Um, I have been known to say that place has been a greater teacher than humans. I wonder, you know, I don't know. I, I have a sense that that has been true because the, the biggest changes seem to have come from place. But I think in learning to live alongside other humans, whether it's in a marriage or a friendship or just in the people that you encounter on Twitter, heaven forbid, <laughs> that is a constant challenge for me just because, um, partly because I judge very quickly um i'm critical uh and although i've always had a very very strong sense of compassion and empathy towards other people i've also had a very very strong sense of um not wanting to be eaten alive by other people so having a very kind of strong boundary so i think in that's a long-winded way of saying that in blurring and in allowing the boundaries to blur between myself and a place which is very much easier and very much less risky it enables you i think to blur the boundaries just enough to still be safe with other people and to really feel uh to to look at them in a way where you're not judging so much but you are seeing it from their perspective as if you were them i'm not very good at putting this this particular kind of thing into words, but I want, does that answer? It's your wonderful. Yeah. There's no right. It's I'm just curious your own experience. So it, it does answer. There doesn't need to be an answer really. It's more uh, musings, <laughs> right? A response. Yeah. Yeah. A response explorations. Um, how about sovereignty, especially being someone that is interested in relationship with landscape. I feel like that really shifts our potential notion of modern day sovereignty. I guess I always have this problem in talking about sovereignty, for which I'll, I'll apologise, but but that is, is in yeah. advance. But that is because in the in the Irish tradition, uh, which is one of my traditions, um, ancestral sovereignty had a particular meaning in a mythological sense, very specific meaning, a very specific word, which basically meant the goddess of the land who was also, the, you know, entwined with the other world, would recognise, in the old stories, would recognise the king, or the queen perhaps, but it was almost always a king even then, who was most fitted to lead his people and yet persuade them to live in balance and harmony with the land. And so the goddess of the land would bestow sovereignty on the king. And because of that, she was known as the goddess of sovereignty. Mm. So sovereignty, in this sense, has that connotation of living in balance and harmony with the land, of knowing what is right, what, you know, what Native American friends often call right relationship. Um, And 
So when people use the word sovereignty to 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 mean personal power, I can't really <laughs> relate to it because um, I'm not very interested in personal power. We've we've had a lot of personal power in our you know the last couple of centuries, and uh, as someone who trained as a psychologist, I think modern psychology has you know made us so tied up in our own sense of personal power in an empowerment sense that we have just really ended up down the wrong track too many times we need to pull back from personal power and look at what it means to live in harmony and balance with all of the beings around us and that's what sovereignty is so it's a slightly different concept in our mythology in this part of the world but it seems to me to be the right one because it puts it outside of us and our power and what I want to be and the individualistic mythology of the West and bring sovereignty out into the wider world and a sense of accommodating and being in relationship, if that makes sense. It completely makes sense. I'm really glad you're sharing that perspective of sovereignty. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, well, one of the things that, um, again, if people have read uh, my book, If Women Are Rooted, they'll know this already, but that sense of of sovereignty was so important in um, the, certainly the Gaelic tradition, which is all of the the only tradition that we have texts for. So that's like Ireland, Scotland, the Isle of Man. That the king would literally marry the land. There was a ceremony, the banisri, um, literally the, the 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 marriage of the king, um, which would take place quite late. You know, up to to relatively recent times in history it wasn't prehistory by any stretch of the imagination where the king would have a, a ceremonial marriage with the goddess of the land and he would commit on behalf of his people to live in balance and harmony and the goddess of the land sovereignty would therefore keep everything going very well and the other thing i love about our mythology is that when that promise is broken there are consequences and i love a good consequence you know, so you don't just get to do that. You're just like, oh, well, maybe, you know, do better next time. No, if you mess up, the land becomes a wasteland or there is a flood, you know, from from one extreme to the other. There are always consequences if you do not live in a way that is in balance and harmony with the land. And that's a very, very good mythology to have, I think. And are there stories of previous moments when that a king did not honor the land and it went into wasteland and they repaired it. They, they went back into well, sovereignty, true sovereignty. Not so much. Yeah, they tend to stop at the, at the exciting stuff, you know, which is when the <laughs> land becomes a wasteland. So you don't get much in the way of recovery, but yeah, yeah the oldest, one of the oldest stories um, uh, in our, in our tradition actually come, comes from the, the Brythonic tradition, the kind of Wales and um, well, the rest of the place other than Scotland and Ireland. Um, where uh, which is a story um in which briefly um the land was said to be scattered with holy wells with sacred wells and people would travel along um the roads and byways of the land and when they came to a well if they were in need of food or drink or other sustenance a maiden would come out of the well she was an otherworldly maiden because mm. the wells were the source of the of the nourishment of an inspiration of the other world and would offer the traveler food and, and drink and there is a very very old story and quite a dramatic story where the king of this particular land uh, did not believe in the old traditions and he didn't really believe in the bargain that he had made and he looked at this very beautiful otherworldly woman who'd come out of the well and um, he raped her and he took away the platters the cups and the, the platters on which she would normally serve food to travelers in need and seeing what the king had done uh, his men thought well this is great and they went around the land and they raped all of the well maidens and the story goes um, again i'm making this very brief um, that as a consequence the maidens retreated into the wells into the other world and they didn't come again to give the life-giving force of the other world to the land and so the land became a wasteland and all the rivers dried up and all the fields dried up and the trees became became bare uh, and that was a proper consequence. Um, and that is a when you could have again, I've been very, very brief about it. When you hear the story in full, it's a short story, but it's very, very powerful and very dramatic. And that is the one of the oldest stories in our mythology. Again, you know, harking back to this idea that we have we 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 have a mythology, a, a cosmology, if you like, in our lineage that tells us how to live in balance and harmony with the land. Um, so that was a that was a a breaking 
um, of the relationship with the goddess of sovereignty. Mm. And that was the consequence. Would you be on the other world for anyone that doesn't have a connection with it? Yeah, I mean, again, in, in the mythology of this part of the world, so I'm talking about all the British Isles, Ireland, and the so-called Celtic countries, you know, along the western seaboard of Europe, the other world was not a place. You know, it wasn't a place that existed somewhere that you would go to. It was kind of another layer of reality that overlapped and entangled with this one. So if you think of it like, you know, say there's a veil between us and the other world, and every now and again the veil parts and you can just peek through, um, which people thought happened at certain times of the year, like Samhain or um, what we now call Halloween, which has just passed, and be able to know, which is May Day, the 1st of May, the veil was particularly thin and you could come and go more easily. Um, but the other world was really kind of, it's difficult to find words to describe it, but it's really kind of like the moral authority. Um, it, it was, it's another layer of reality that is laid on top of the physical world. And I suspect we don't, you know, we don't have much information about the old belief systems uh, we can glean a lot from some of the stories, but we don't have a lot of information. But I suspect that it was very much like um, the world that we find in, say, Sufi um, belief systems and in other ancient Greek and um, other ancient civilizations of Europe, where the idea was that there was a, a world called the imaginal world, which lay between the physical world of our senses and the kind of intellectual or spiritual transcendental world. And this imaginal world, which I think of as our other world, was the places where the archetypes lived, where the stories lived, where synchronicities came from, you know, where there were guides, angels and demons um, who could come to us and, and give us a clue. It was kind of the, the world of the soul, if you like. And it was an intermediary world that was very, very important and kind of was a kind of intermediary between us and the divine. And I think of the other world as very much like that, um, that it is a place, again, where there's full of archetypal beings and energies and animals and um, adventures, you know, people are called to the other world to go on a particular adventure. But it's very, very different from the, the traditions in which there is an underworld which is the land of the dead the other world in our tradition is not a land of the dead it's a land of the living is there anything before we close our time together that you feel inspired to share well i, I think I, I would just say that um although it's kind of a year away my next book is very much following on in in the tradition of the writing that i've been doing about the myths and the archetypal uh, beings, the stories in our native traditions here in Europe, which help us to see a way through life. And so my next book is actually about elderhood in women. Mm -hmm. So it's about the myths and stories of elderhood. Uh, it's called Hagitude, which is a word that I, um, I know I woke up in the middle of the night one time and just said to myself, Hagitude. And <laughs> no idea what that was about, where it came from. The next morning, I thought that sounds like a good title for a book. Um, and so, deeply embedded in the stories and the fairy tales um, here in, in in Western Europe, are these wonderful, powerful old women. Very different kinds of old women. You know, sometimes they're mentors. Sometimes they're like the fates weaving the world into being. Sometimes they're really dangerous testers like Baba Yaga from the Slavic tradition. But they show us, I think, all of these old women show us different ways of becoming elder and, different, and give us clues into um, how we might display the particular gifts that each of us brings to elderhood if we're lucky enough to get there. And so I suppose... What I would say kind of maybe in passing is that these old stories, traditions, myths, whatever you want to call them that we have are so full of wisdom. I'm still finding it. A book after Hagitude, which I'm not going to tell you about because I haven't really kind of got to grips with it yet, will be yet another way of looking at those old stories and some archetypal energy, which is so important for women. And so I would say really look at those stories, go find them, read them, 
tell them, tell them to your kids, keep the stories alive and see what they have to offer you because the stories are always changing as well. You know, they're not just static. Um, they're here for us in these very, very strange and, and challenged times, just as they were here for our ancestors a thousand or 2000 years ago. So the, the power of that old mythology which is in our lineage, those of us who have ancestry here in the West, is really very, very deep and can help us find ways of living, whether it's in our relationships with the world, with the planet, or whether it's in our, in our ability to fully offer our own unique gift to the world. And, you know, they're there for free. They're not just stories for kids. They're, they're kind of teaching stories. And um, I kind of encourage everybody who's listening to to go and, and find those stories and see what they have to offer you. 